there's really so much fun stuff in history. I, I mean, behind me, that, that flag hanging down, that's, that's the third flag from D-Day, when we went in on D-Day. I mean, think how many guys lost their life under that banner there. And do you know, America used to respect the flag so much. We have some Medal of Honor winner things over here, guys who won the Medal of Honor. Do you know, there were at least 42 guys who won the Medal of Honor. That's the highest military commendation we give any soldier. 42 guys won that simply because they never let the flag touch the ground. That's how much we respected our flag. 42 guys got the medal. Yeah, one of the guys, the first black guy to get a Medal of Honor was William Carney, the earliest point in the, uh, in the Civil War. He got shot four times. He leading the flag, leading all that troop out front. They were, they were down in, in Louisiana, and he's leading against the Confederates. And, and everybody follows the flag, and that used to be the song, Follow the Flag, Boys. I mean, the, the guy out front doesn't have a gun, and he's the one running straight at the enemy with all the guys. By. Got shot four times, never let the flag hit the ground, got the Medal of Honor. That's how much we respected the flag. And, and so that flag right there, hanging there, YMS 379 was a ship it was on. I mean, the guys who did so much for that flag, and today we just don't think it's a big deal, and we're not going to respect it. And, and we're, no, that goes back to a Supreme Court decision back in the 70s where the U.S. Supreme Court said, oh, it, it's okay to burn the flag. It doesn't mean that much. We have free speech. No, no, free speech says you can burn the flag. Actually burning the flag, that's not free speech. That's behavior, and we've always regulated behavior. That's what every civil law does. If you want to talk about burning the flag, talk about it. But actually doing it, now we don't have any respect for the flag or the country or what it stands for, and that's really kind of unfortunate because it's hard to stay a nation when you don't have something to unify around. And, and, and we used to know exactly what that was. As a matter of fact, it was a church mission director and choir leader who designed that flag. So it was not a secular deal like we think of today. But, you know, talking about that Supreme Court decision, um, the court does a whole lot of things today that's really not supposed to. It's not supposed to make policy. The founding fathers are really clear about that. Matter of fact, you'll find that back in their day when a judge tried to make policy, they would take the judge off the court through impeachment. That just wasn't to be allowed because that's not an elected branch. So you don't let the unelected branch make policy. Well, that's all over their writings, but we don't study that, that today. And so we let judges tell us when life begins or how marriage is going to be defined or what your sexuality is. Or, no, Bible's already determined that. People already know that. Really simple. But you get a lot of social engineering that goes to the courts now because people that can't win in the legislature take it to the court. So we've been involved in a number of court cases. I've been involved in seven cases of the U.S. Supreme Court, and they all deal with history of some kind. Um, w one of the, the cases we dealt with history is whether you could even mention the word God at a public school graduation. And, and you know, I'm standing here surrounded by a bunch of old textbooks, but here, here's kind of a fun one. Uh, this is the first textbook ever printed in American history. This was printed in 1690 in Boston, and it lasted until 1930. So 240 years, we use this as the book from which you learn to read in school. Now, this particular one here, when you open it up on the inside, it has here New England Primer, Boston, 1777. Hmm, that's pretty early. And you go back one page. And it shows you the hero of the country that time, John Hancock. He's the president of Congress. And, and so we have him there. And, and this is the ABCs. And so it starts you out showing you the ABCs. You're, you're learning to read. Letters, the alphabet. And then it puts letters together to make syllables. And then it has what's called words of one syllable and great letters and easy syllables and words of two syllables and words of three syllables. And then you get to a rhyming alphabet. This little part right now. Remember, this is what we did in public schools for 240 years. This rhyming alphabet says, A, in Adam's fall, we send all. There's a picture of Adam Eve in the garden there. B, heaven to find the Bible mind. It's a guy reading the Bible. C, Christ crucified for sinners die. That's the alphabet in public schools. It's all, it's all these Bible phrases. And as you keep going, now you get into longer words and you're able to handle different words. And, and then you get over to the second alphabets. This is the alphabet of lessons for youth. That was the rhyming alphabet, this alphabet of lessons for youth. And you can see the ABCs going down the page here. Let me read you what we memorized. A, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Oh, that's Proverbs 15, 16. B, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. That's another verse in Proverbs. C, come unto Christ, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He will give you rest. That's 
Jesus out of Matthew. And, and, and the court's saying, oh, no, you can't mention the word God at schools. The founders wouldn't want that. What's this? Oh, John Hancock. As a matter of fact, you'll find that the founding fathers reprinted this in their states so their kids would have it too because this is what they grew up on in schools and there was nothing secular thinking about that. So we get involved in a lot of court cases, cases dealing with the Ten Commandments or with religious expression or prayer at football games or whatever, and it goes back to our history. And we have such a bad view of our own history today that we let judges tell us, oh, no, 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 they've always been secular. We're not supposed to be praying at schools. Really? No, you, you are if you see history. And see, this is even what's leading to all the stuff with the monuments today. We know nothing about our own history. We think we do. And if you go through university today, you'll know every reason in the world why you should hate America and why America is such a terrible nation. Because at universities, we cover the bad and the ugly, but never the good. And so we come out of school disliking America, wanting to destroy everything. And if somebody tells us that statue represents something racist, well, not that we've ever studied that part of history. That's just what my professor told me, so I just repeat it. And the problem is, even if it does represent something racist, you know, it's an interesting thing. If you go through Israel today, you have all these great kings in Israel's history, and you've got bad kings as well. And if you go into Israel, not only do they have monuments to King David, and not only do they have David's palace there in the old Jerusalem, they also have a monument to Absalom. And they have streets named after King Ahab. Are you kidding me? But you see, they know their history well enough to say, you know what, that's a really bad guy. Don't be like him. Be like, be like David. You see, we could look at history and teach lessons because we knew our history. We can't do that today. We can't point at that statue and say, you know what, that statue reminds us of a time when we had a lot of racism in America, and that guy really was a racist, but that's a good reminder for us not to be a racist. No, 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 we got to take it down. Do you know, in, in, in Germany today, and, and certainly they had real problems with racism, World War II, the extermination of, of, of 6 million Jews and 7 million Gentiles, 13 million people of faith wiped out by the Germans. Um, they still have concentration camps set up there. They didn't tear them down. They still have Hitler's bunker. They didn't tear it down. They still have all sorts of SS headquarters and Gestapo places. They use that to teach because you can learn from history. You can learn from the good and the bad and the ugly. And Germany has about that much toleration for neo-Nazis today. Why? Because they know their history. See, in America, we don't know our history. We just respond to platitudes and respond to sound bites. And we elect our presidents on one and two word phrases. You know, they're dealing with how many issues, but we elect them on really, and, and, and that's the unfortunate part is we don't know our, it's a great example. Thomas Jefferson, they're wanting to tear down statues of Thomas Jefferson because he owns slaves. He sure did. And he's one of the loudest voices in American history about ending slavery. Now, we'll never hear that today. There's a reason that for two centuries, black civil rights leaders praised Thomas Jefferson for all he did to try to end slavery. All we hear today is he owned slaves. He sure did. But the state of Virginia... By his state law in Virginia, not his state law, the state law in the state where he lived, he was not allowed to free his own slaves. So he worked to end slavery everywhere. He introduced laws to end slavery in Virginia, couldn't get them passed. He introduced the national anti-slavery law in 1784. It fell by one vote. We came within one vote of ending slavery in 1784. And Jefferson wrote, oh, that God would have changed one heart. He wanted slavery ended in the whole. He worked in slavery in other nations across the world. You'll never hear that about Thomas Jefferson today. You'll never hear that black civil rights leaders praised him for all he did to try to end racism and slavery. All we get today is Jefferson owned slaves. Therefore, he's a really bad guy. You know how ridiculous that is, is... What if, what if people 50 years from now say, you know, that woman, Abby Johnson or, or all these others ha had abortions, therefore they were pro-abortion. No, there's a whole lot of people that lead the pro-life movement now that once had abortions. And we don't say that they're, they're anti-life because they once had an abortion because God forgives that, takes care of it. If you ask forgiveness, he does. And you've got so many former abortion clinic owners that now lead pro-life movement today, but 50 years from now, the way we teach history today, we're going to think that anybody that ever had an abortion hated life. 
and, and hated protecting unborn kids, even those that fought. And that's, that's the way it is with Thomas Jefferson. So there's so much fun history all around us. That's the kind of things we get involved with. We also have leadership training sessions, and, you know, because kids really don't get much of this today. Um, in the summer times, for two weeks at AWAC, we bring in up to 50 college kids from 18 to 25. We know what their professors teach them, and, and we know all the negative stuff. And we bring them in, and we let them see all the stuff and handle it for themselves. It's, it's amazing the change that happens because we show them seven questions that they can use to go back and confront their pre professors and get the professors pointed in the right direction. It is so much fun to see kids in this generation not being picked off by education, but rather starting to change education in the right direction. So we do a lot in the summer with that. We also do training sessions for history and social studies teachers because, again, when you come in and get to handle this stuff, it's completely, it's completely different from what you're told in the textbook. So they get to see that. Now they teach a whole bunch of kids about that, and that helps turn the nation around. We also do pastors' conferences in Washington, D.C. Um, we take pastors there to the U.S. Capitol. We take them on a spiritual heritage tour of the U.S. Capitol. Most folks don't have a clue that walking through the Capitol, you're walking through what used to be the largest church in America, the U.S. Capitol. Starts back in December of 1800 when Thomas Jefferson is the president of the Senate, Theodore Sedgwick is the Speaker of the House, and they said, we have the brand new Capitol. Let's use the biggest room in the Capitol for church every Sunday. And they set up a church service every Sunday in the Capitol. And by the time you get to 1860s, it's the largest church in America. Really? The one at the Capitol? Yeah. That's where the presidents went to church. That's where the senators went to church. That's where the congressmen went to church. And Thomas Jefferson helped set that. I thought Jefferson wanted separation church and state. No. Jefferson said separation church and state means the government can't stop a religious activity, which is why it's fine to have church inside the U.S. Capitol. And by the way, most people don't know that church service has been resurrected. It now goes on every week at the U.S. Capitol. There's church back in the Capitol again. And so we take pastors to D.C. and let them see this stuff where it actually happened. And that's an old building there. And we can show them where John Adams stood and where Thomas Jefferson was. And, and here's where Jefferson was when, when the first woman preached a sermon to Congress, Dorothy Ripley in 1806. Pretty cool discussion that happened there with Jefferson and Dorothy Ripley. Nobody gets that kind of history. So we do pastor's conferences in D.C. Uh, we bring in 12 to 15 senators and U.S. congressmen who are strong believers, who have a biblical worldview, who do the right thing for God. Let the pastors share from them. We never hear about those guys on the news, but there's a lot of good guys in D.C. We also have several hundred state legislators across the nation, and once a year we bring them together for a pro-family legislators conference. And what we do is we look... We'll, we'll monitor up to 100,000 bills every year, every session. And we'll try to determine the 12 to 15 big things that these guys are going to be facing in the next year. We'll get them together, and we'll give them a historical look at it, a biblical look at it. Uh, we'll, we'll give them a statistical look at it and try to equip them with what they need to go back in their states and move that the right direction. And it really works well. I mean, just the start of this year, um, these guys went after protecting religious liberty. We had more than 40 bills passed in the state legislatures. The previous high before this year was only two bills in a state legislature passed. Now we've got over 40. So these guys really do a good job of going back. And again, this is not stuff you hear on the news, but this is the kind of stuff that we do at Wall Builders is we take this stuff and go out and shape the culture and affect things because it's really taken us back to who we used to be. It's taken us back to when America really was significant. Uh, it's taken us back to a biblical worldview, and it's helping Christians understand that God's a whole lot bigger than the inside of the four walls of our church every Sunday morning. He does a whole lot of stuff outside the church we're just not aware of.